Everybody please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. President Curto. Yep. Vice President Daly. Yeah. Trustee Champlin. Here. Trustee Henderson. Yeah. And Trustee Schwartz. Here. Thank you, Julia. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody, welcome. Thank you for coming, uh, taking your time out of your day, evening. Uh, tonight's election day, uh, not at the school, but nationally. So hopefully we can, for anyone who hasn't voted, we can try to get you out just before the polls. Uh, Voting is important. Everybody should vote. And when we get to voting time on the school side of things in May, uh, we will re-emphasize the fact that people don't vote in school elections. And it's an absolute travesty. I think 25, 26 percent of eligible voters vote in school elections, uh, which is dismal. Um, but we'll get to that later. So everybody, if you didn't vote, go vote. Uh, two quick things. Um, I got copied on a bunch of emails today from the Haldane Elementary School with regards to the Haldane's first annual family spaghetti dinner, uh, which is going to be Thursday, November 13th, 6.30 to 8 at the cafeteria. And as of 4 o'clock, uh, Mrs. Sniffen confirmed there was over 150 signups, which is amazing. Um, so I want to just thank, uh, I know that was talked about at the Wellness Committee, and thank uh, Julia Sniffen, Sandy uh, McKelvey, uh, Lauren Colical, who's the uh, Food Service Director, who actually does a great job, by the way. And her Facebook page has, is pretty cool if you like food. Uh, and Ann Dinio as well, I understand, is piping in on that. So if you can, come out to support the family uh, spaghetti night dinner, and hopefully it becomes an annual event. Uh, it's to benefit the farm to school program uh, as well as local food in the cafeteria, which is all good stuff. Uh, lastly, uh, we're postseason time for Haldane Athletics, our student athletes. Uh, I believe cross country boys and girls both won the section uh, last weekend. Uh, boys came up a little short but had a great season. Uh, I know they were disappointed on that one. Uh, but had a great season. Uh, girls volleyball won this afternoon. Uh, they go on to the state regional semifinals, and if they win that, they go to the state final four. And the girls soccer team right now is playing, I think as we speak, uh, up at Arlington High School. And if they win today, and I think they were winning, uh, they will go to the state final four. So for anyone who uh, is into school spirit, um, this stuff's all fun. I think if you Google uh, school spirit, Haldane will come up. <laughs> uh, as your first hit, uh, but it's all good stuff and it's a lot of fun if you've never been to one of the events around this time of year. So with that said, I will defer over to Dr. Bowers. Okay, good evening everyone. Um, we have a number of different things to share with you tonight. Um, so tomorrow we begin the last of three parts of our discovery process and we finalized um, the, the meetings with, for the first two parts. Um, at this point, we have, as an entire district with all constituent groups, we have defined who we are um, as Haldane at this moment in time. We have decided on what we want the characteristics and the skill set and the goals to be for the graduate of 2024. And then we are having a group, the Public Education and Business Coalition, coming in um, from Colorado tonight. They'll be with us for the next three days, helping us figure out um, the third part. Um, so now that we know who we are and we know where we're going, um, the third part is how we get there. So by Friday afternoon, we will have had all the groups, um, the school committees coming together, and we will be talking about um, a plan which is how we will be able to get the characteristics of the child of, tw of graduate of 2024. Um, and we will um, hopefully look at, at some very innovative and unique um, ideas that will be given to our strategic planning committee. 
We have, um, at this point, about 25 people that have volunteered to be part of the Strategic Planning Committee. There are some invitations that will also go out be beyond the volunteers, and we're going to be holding our first Strategic Planning Meeting in January of 2015. Um, there will be one in February, March, and April um, to determine the strategic plan. The plan will be presented to the board in May and then in June hopefully we'll be adopting a strategic plan. So the PEBC will be coming in um, to work with us first in small groups and we'll have all the educators in the district coming through into small group conversations on Wednesday and Thursday morning and then Thursday and Friday we'll be, fi we'll be finalizing um, our plans to get there. So that is both the first and the second of the superintendent's report put together. Um, so school peace officer, within the last um, three weeks to a month, we've had a number of conversation regarding um, the, the role of police officers and how they, um, how they are to um, introduce themselves and um, the ways in which we will interface most successfully um, with both local and, and county police officers. And so through this conversation, we, have, we were looking at all different combinations and all different opportunities available to us. And we had a, a conversation with the Putnam County Sheriff who was sharing some information about um, school resource officers and for the second year running school peace officers. And school peace officers are a little bit different than a resource officer. They're retired. Um, the, the way that New York State works is when someone retires from a state job, they can make up to $30,000 a year. And teachers and police officers and anybody who has worked under um, the New York State government falls um, within that category. And so peace officers are people that are working. They work full time um, in a school setting, and they are uh, much more cost effective because they are under the guidelines of the $30,000. So that may be an option for us to look at in the future and have conversations about um, if we believe that consistency and police presence is the way that we should be going. So not only are we talking a little bit about the best way to interface, um, we have an updated um, version of a policy that um, was sent to the board and actually was updated again a little bit today so there's some new information that came into it and so that um, that's something that we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking about um, in, in the near future. The fourth report this um, for the superintendent's report um, we have recently been given information about um, some of the areas um, within our building, um, within this building, in which there is need for asbestos abatement. And um, we have found that within um, the auditorium, if you look at the auditorium or otherwise known as the small gym behind the basketball courts, there are some areas that are beginning to show signs of disrepair. And when we looked at the makeup of those areas, they are hot for asbestos. So our consultant has very strongly um, suggested that we deal with the, the areas just behind the basketball courts immediately. And um, there are a couple of places that are really in need of immediate fixes. That's one of them. And with basketball season coming up and the kids going in there, um, to practice, we feel it's something that we probably need to look at doing over the Thanksgiving break. So um, there's some information about it, um, the recommendation, uh, the cost. Um, we had a number of different um, companies bid on the cost and um, they are, if you look into the, the letter that was sent, um, the the Mabel Merritt area, we have certain, we have some information for the Mabel Merritt area. We have certain information from some wrapping of pipes underneath um, in the Mabel Merritt. And then we also have this area that is be, uh, behind the, the basketball courts, which is the first area that we have to get fixed. So I wanted to share that information with you. We really need to look at doing something, as I said, immediately before basketball season starts. So I don't know if there are questions or thoughts that you have with that. How quick do we need to <coughs> act on that? I haven't seen the letter yet. 
Um, well, we need to. I mean, can we do it at the next meeting? We wouldn't have time to arrange with the company um, unless we give that we ask them to pencil us in, which is an option. And we've already talked a little bit about that. Just having them, um, you know, put us on their calendar, and then if the board approves it at the next meeting, it's certainly something that um, we can forward and go ahead with at that point. But we will have to have a placeholder if we hope to get it done within the next couple of weeks. And when would you want to do? You'd want to do it over over Thanksgiving. We'd either have to do it over Thanksgiving or we'd have to do it over a long weekend. There's, there's also the timing is a little bit problematic because we're getting very close to the play in the beginning of December. So they're going to be in and getting the props on the stage and starting mm -hmm. to do what they need to do there. So um, we, we know that this is something we have to do. We're trying to figure out the best way of accommodating everybody that needs to use the auditorium and go from there. Because I, I know that we're planning on using it over the vacation, yeah. the, the play. Yeah. And so, so we're looking at the, the, the I mean, there may be, it, it may not be a huge abatement area, mm -hmm. um, but we have to find out what that is. So we're at the point that we're learning a little bit about how much it will actually infiltrate into the auditorium and what they need to do. So. Diana letter here and it seems to suggest that it's uh, going to be about 43,000 plus the 7,500. Well I think the 7,500 is for the auditorium alone. So Ann, do you have some information you want to share there? Yes. The, um, if just the areas that we're speaking about, the, um, the pipe insulation that really needs to be done because it's uh, an area that our maintenance um, will access, especially over the winter, um, that the insulation needs to be removed. That's recommended that it be done right away. And the area in the gym um, comes to just over $14,000. If we were going to address um, really not critical areas in Mabel Merritt, then it's 43,000. The 7,500 is for um, air monitoring and testing during the abatement. So $7,500 is um, an incidental cost to the asbestos abatement, but the abatement itself for the two critical areas are just over 14000 But the, the areas within Mabel Merritt, we are not looking at doing those immediately. That's kind of a heads up that they're, we're starting to realize that there's, there has to be something done with the ceiling in the Mabel Merritt building. Um, the areas that are critical, and the area that is the most critical is uh, the ones within the auditorium. So what are we looking at in terms of uh, cost for the critical items that we need to get done? About $22,000. And do we have uh, a line in our budget that we can uh, tap for those funds, the maintenance uh, mm -hmm. budget line? We're going to have to go. I'm, both, I'm sure, Ann, I'll let you answer. I know you've been looking at it. Um, that would really uh, completely wipe us out in the operations and maintenance because this is an unbudgeted item and um, being that this is just November, it, it worries me because we have the whole school year to go for maintenance projects and repairs. Yeah. Um, there is um, still money left in the roof bond referendum from when this was done. There's a, an amount in the capital projects that certainly we can use for this if the board determines that they would like to spare the, the general fund budget for the rest of the year and use the um, unspent money from when the roof was put on. Is that currently in our capital reserve fund? Yes. It it's not in the capital reserve. It's in the capital fund. Oh. The capital right. reserve um, is where we we took the money for the field referendum. Right. And there's about 2000 left in that that we're talking about funding in the, for future repairs. But the active capital fund still has, um, it's, it's we refer to it as the balance of the roof bonds. And I just want to clarify, the 22000 you cited is both the abatement and then all the moder monitoring that has to happen after that. Yes. So the, the abatement itself is about 15, a little under 15000 And it can't be encapsulated? 
It can, but it was almost the same amount of money. It was, it was interestingly close. We thought it would be a lot cheaper if we encapsulated it, but it was, it was not. It was more expensive than we anticipated. So yes, the answer is yes, it can be encapsulated, but it's not, that, it's not a savings or an overall savings to do that. Future, if something happens to the encapsulation, you're yeah. still stuck with your original problem. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, some information. Um, sports teams whose numbers of participants will require additional supervision. We have the good news is that we have about 60 kids that have signed up for. Um, our, our winter track and the bad news is we have about 60 kids signed up for the for winter track because we only have the, the funding in our budget for um, one main coach and so when we saw that we're I mean we're thrilled that so many kids want to be part of the program and are and are hoping to be um, on the team but in order to do that it would necessitate putting on um, an additional assistant coach to have that happen. And so when we started talking about the fact that we may be looking at additional staffing or we're looking at cuts, um, which we'd prefer not to do, um, I, Joe asked me to get some information um, from Tom Cunningham about the, the point, and we kind of, we're just kind of calling it the tipping point, of when we have to really think about getting additional staffing for the safety of the sports teams. So there is a document that's, that's been listed um, and within that document we have the number of students that we believe is um, the, the top level or the tipping point before we have to consider getting additional staffing. And so um, there, for all the different sports that are listed there, I also on the bottom um, list, listed for you the number of people um, who have actually signed up. So for the winter track, um, the, the, the top number is 35 students and we actually have 60 signed up. So we do not have the assistant budgeted um, and so we thought we needed to bring this to you for conversation and decide how we're gonna handle this. So the, the stipend is about 25 and change, 2,500 and change. Um, so I, I need to know how you'd like us to proceed. And Diana, just to the, it looks like the boys and girls basketball, if it goes over 18, we need an assistant coach. And it says down here that we're at 25 and 22. Yeah. Um, well, I think that that's about I think that there may be a little bit of, of room, but that's what the, the top level right now that they're considering is 18. So, so then we, we would maybe cut kids or assume there'd be some attrition? Right. Yeah, they'll, they'll never keep more than 14 tops on a basketball team. Okay, so these are just kids yeah. that like, sign up saying, I want to do it, but they don't yeah. necessarily. I can't see them keeping more than 14. Okay. We do believe that even with attrition, we're going to probably have more than the 35 for track, though. I mean, the track has always seemed to have been a little different um, and on a positive side that it's where you know a lot of people are encouraging kids to participate in its exercise it's um, you know a chance to participate in the school activities um, it's a little different than like a basketball and a soccer and stuff just from a operational angle at least from my experience through the years um, I mean I remember when they started the track program and you know they were crying to get kids so I mean I think it's a good thing um, and if I understand it correctly and Ann, maybe you can uh, pipe in um, the overall budget if you were to define it for sports because there is some volatility to it to it it kind of fluctuates a little bit up and down based on how we spend the money and what teams don't meet and what things happen versus don't happen how do we look in the grand scheme of things? Well, when the budget's created, you know, we don't, our budget is not for only what we know is going to happen. You know, as you heard from our auditor last week, we are spending about 96 to 90 percent, 97 percent of our budget um, 
if we budgeted for only what we knew about we'd be spending a hundred percent of our budget and that's not fiscally responsible or is it realistic because something unexpected always comes up look we were facing twenty two thousand dollars of unexpected with the asbestos so is there room somewhere in the budget where we could afford an additional coach because of these circumstances yes the budget can support that um, and with any unbudgeted expenditure it just inches us farther above that 97 nine percent that that we've been spending for our budget um, and you know it's a budget so with what we have in there for sports if there are less trips that are taken, if different people sign up to drive for a sports trip and that's, there's a salary difference there, if a, a more senior person doesn't drive, and depends on the mileage. Right. It's all, it's very, you know, how many repairs does the bus need this year? Um, I think that we would be all right funding another, um, but again, that, we're at that that high end of of 96 percent to 97. Um, we didn't have much of a budget increase this year, as everybody knows, 0.27 percent. Um, so we just have to be mindful. But this is it's what we're here for is for the students, right? Um, so. Well, certainly, I'd like to find a way to accommodate this if we if we possibly can. But I'm getting definitely very nervous about the, the, the number of unanticipated expenses that we're incurring this year. Uh, and to your point about our budget being at the 96 to 97% level, what's left over at the end is our fund balance that we've been applying in the last few years to the following year's budget. It's been filling a hole that we have no way to fill otherwise. So, and if we spend 100% of our budget, that puts us in a very precarious situation for next year. Right. And that's uh, why we don't budget so. for 100% of our anticipated right. expenditures. But we can't now look at that 3% and say, hey, that's right. up for grabs, let's right. just go spend it. Uh, definitely not. So I would say, can we look elsewhere and see other possibly some clubs that uh, have only a very minimal participation rate in students and maybe they want their, their items that we need to think about cutting, we're going to add a add a coach to track uh, to, to uh, enable these students to participate. Is there somewhere else that we, we can look for for some savings? But clubs, don't, they're more of like an all year thing, right? So they've, those stipends have been kind of already assigned and mm -hmm. promised for, at least for this year. Yes. Right. But we could maybe look for next year to say, hey, or maybe clubs aren't going to work and we have to look some, well, what else right. can we trim back on? in order to make this, uh, to make the coaching position work. Because we had a tough time last spring uh, right. talking about coaches. Uh, so it's not the kind of thing that we can just throw back without careful uh, thought as to other things that we might do, I think. To right. And I think we're always looking at areas that we, that if we're n n not, ab we don't absolutely need them that we can cut back on. Um, and you're right, we have a number of surprises this year, right from the beginning of the summer. Um, luckily, the insurance paid for a good portion of some of the issues that we dealt with this summer. But um, we also are going to be looking at um, some, some tree. Um, we've been bringing arborists in. We're going to have to look at tree removal because we have a couple of trees that have come down within the last couple of months. And we have other trees that look like they may possibly be be just about ready to come down. So that's something we're going to have to talk about. Um, and most of the things that all of a sudden have cropped up are, you, are health and safety issues. So they're not things that we can just ignore. There's, we have to do them. Um, in, in this situation, um, we couldn't, health and safety wise, we can't support 60 students with the number of staffing we have. So we'll have to figure out what to do beyond that. Is it's early, still early in the school year that yes. we can find these ways to tighten our belts and say, mm -hmm. you know, do we really need that for the rest of the year or, or something? Um, uh, typically, if I recall through the years, um, 
at least I know since Tom has been here, Tom Cunningham, he does a pretty good job of keeping an eye on that and is very diligent as far as being creative in his funding box. Um, it may not appear that because you see kids walking around with sweatshirts and sweaters and stuff like that, but the reality is, and John knows that very well, those are all privately funded. Um, so it may look like there's a more grandiose, but when you break down that what he's doing with the creativity of his department, he's pretty creative. And I own my own company, and I envy some of the things that he does creativity-wise as far as having his budget line. He's really good about that. Um, you know, and I think we've got to just keep that in consideration also. There's also a little bit of a um, precedent concern, right, so that if we say yes to this and we find the money for an assistant coach, then is it kind of expected that we'll have an assistant coach for this team every year? And um, and how do we figure that in the budget? Right. Okay. I mean, I'm in favor of doing it rather than sending the kids out. Um, I think it's a small amount of money, and I think we can creatively figure it out. And I think we can tell Tom specifically, you got to make it work, and he will, because mm -hmm. he always does, and he does every year. So that's just my thought. So why don't you guys type in and... Yeah, I need to tell 20 kids, sorry, I couldn't come up with 2,500 bucks, so find something else to do for the winter. That, that's saying, that sounds silly. Evan, any yeah, thoughts? I mean, I, I think they'll find, I mean, as Ann said, it's early in the season. I find it hard to, to believe that, that we can't find a couple thousand dollars for an assistant coach, so I'm, I'm sure between that and, and, and Tom, don't do it. So it's just gonna go back to Tom and then, okay. So if, if you're ready to give him the conceptual nod at the next meeting, we'll bring you a name for a recommendation. Yeah, and I would have him say, Tom, come up with some scenarios on pieces of paper that make sense based on your projecting out through the year. I mean, the boys' soccer team, I think, was projected to go further. So I know right there you've got some funds that didn't happen. Um, mm -hmm. And that kind of stuff happens all the time. That's what makes his job virtually impossible. Right. Uh, but he's good at it. And we're lucky enough to have a lot of young people going to the, the regionals and the, the finals. And, the, and so, um, you know, hopefully we'll continue to have that. But there are some dollars and cents that we can glean from some of those areas. Okay. Um, and the, the numbers that we have here will probably go into regulation at this point, so we have um, some measure, some indicator of where we are with the teams and when we've gone a uh, little too high with, for the staffing that we presently have. Okay, so I want to go back to a couple of these other ones, but I'll wait till you're finished with your report. <laughs> so we have, um, we also have s some recent parking um, issues that we're contending with on campus, and because of some of the changes that the village needed to make um, on some of the neighboring roads, we've lost a number of parking spaces. Uh, that our students have been using in the past and some they were new parking spaces um, that we lost and then there were others that were parking spaces from what I understand that have been used for many years that were also lost. So we're trying to figure out how to balance that so there are places for the kids to park. Um, Joe, I know that you asked about the area across the street on 9D. Um, that is available for student use. Uh, there are, there have been times that people who are not um, Haldane students or faculty have parked there, but we may have to recapture that space since we've lost so much, so many other places. Um, we're also getting an idea of what areas on school property we could actually extend parking lots to allow for more parking because it's a, it's a problem no matter where you are on campus. It's a problem that pick up and drop off and. Um, so we're looking at different opportunities and different areas that we may be able to just put, you know, some item 
is an item for the, the down and, and just kind of roll it out and, and have, won't be a paved parking lot, but it'll be certainly a place that kids could park. So we're going to be looking at that and we'll be talking about that more in the future. But, um, and I know that there is a letter that you're going to be talking about uh, that was, was related to this, so we'll talk about that later on. Okay, uh, our book read, just want to remind you that we are going to read the second section. I believe it's up to page 104 in Leadership on the Line uh, for our next meeting. So we hope you enjoy getting ready for that. And I'm going to have to twist somebody's arm to be the conversation leader um, at our next meeting, but we'll let you know who that will be. I haven't twisted hard enough right now yet. So <coughs> that's coming. Um, and uh, the Board of Education, um, the workshop that is on November 18th, um, we invite anybody who would like to come in and listen. We're going to be talking about some of the, the things that have been discussed throughout the district about p modifying the start time of the school day. And um, we have had many very deep, fruitful conversations in all schools and in all areas of the district looking at potentials, um, and so we'll, we'll be bringing that to you at our next meeting. And just to be clear, I guess for the public and for the board, we've discussed this already, but just to rediscuss it, uh, we're not going to make any decisions on the 18th of November as to starting later, starting incrementally later. Really what it's about is to listen to what the options are, why they're options, and why this is something that we should be talking about. And my understanding is nobody's having this conversation in Putnam, Northern Westchester, and Lower Westchester, <laughs> if I understand it correctly. I'm not hearing of any other districts. Right. So that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have the conversation, because I've read the pediatric report and its length, and it seems to make perfect sense from a science standpoint. Now we have to get into the minutia of how does it work and can it work. But we're not here to make it. I got an email the other day from someone who asked, they're figuring out babysitting for January after Christmas, and how will this affect their work schedule? And I said, well, we're not, we're not there yet. Um, but I think what it will be is a good conversation and find out what A does to B, which does to C, which does to D, and does to E. And rather than focus on why we can't do it, why should we do it, and how can we make it work? So I think the conversation is probably going to go on for a little while, uh, but we're not there to make a decision on November 18th. And I just want to clarify that, so uh, you know it's pretty clear. And I think we're all on the same page with that. Okay. Um, just I want to go back to two things. Sure. Um, the concept of the peace officer, um, we. Uh, I think we belong to those list serves where we can send something out and all the school districts respond as to what they participate in. Is there a way of getting like what school districts participate in that program? Well, I can tell you I was at a superintendent's meeting with all the superintendents in Putnam County. And so all of, I, I know Garrison does not have um, a peace officer um, or a resource officer, but they have some kind of a a schedule of, um, I guess, um, participation on the part of the Sheriff's Department. Um, we obviously don't, um, but all other districts in Putnam County had at least um, one resource or peace officer, and most of the districts had more than one. But I will get you the exact numbers. Okay. And, the, and maybe just something on the resource officer. I mean, I remember it from a few years ago, but maybe it's changed somewhat. Um, if I remember correctly, it's somewhat tied into like a curriculum as part of it. They're not just police guys walking around. Oh, no, they're very much part of this, the right. substructure and the infrastructure of the entire school district. Okay, so that would yep. be great too. We'll do that. And then just going back to the asbestos conversation, mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I have no con you know, problems fixing something that needs to be fixed because it's an emergency. Um, you know, I'd like to hear more about it as to where it came from and how we think we can be creative on the financing side. I know you threw out some things. Um, can we, without creating undue hardship, uh, pencil us in the calendar and have a more detailed conversation at the next meeting? Yes, we can. This, this is the first I've seen it, so I'm kind of fuzzy on the execution side of it. The 22 grand's 22 grand. Yeah. I don't know what do you guys 
What do you guys think? And, and if we can get the clarification on as far as, because anytime in my building, in my school, anytime we do a, a asbestos uh, abatement, nobody could be in the building. So, like, even if it could be on the fourth floor, nobody could be inside the building um, except for uh, custodial staff. So, and that's always been made crystal clear. I don't know if that's a city regulation. I don't know if it's a state regulation. Well, having been in districts locally where uh -huh. asbestos abatement was occurring, you can't be in that portion of the building, but you can be in the building itself. And this okay. is actually a very small abatement project. I mean, it's literally like two parts of two walls and that's the whole thing. And it's not that it's a huge project, it's just they have to bring in all the equipment and all the air monitoring and everything else that goes along with it. Um, but yes, um, it's, I mean, you can be in the building. What, we, what we would be the best case scenario, if it's not over Thanksgiving, it would be a very, uh, it would be done on a weekend and we just wouldn't be able to use the auditorium. So. The last time, I'm sorry. The last time that um, this happened, and we did it over a long weekend. Um, we did use the building. They construct a containment structure around the area, um, and there there won't be any furniture or anything in this area. So um, the, I think the biggest thing would probably be the the backboard, and that that is decontaminated afterwards. Um, but they do build something around it, and we post on all of the entrances just to let people know. But um, you're, they're going to be allowed into safe areas. And am I remembering there being a little discussion with Mike Twardy about either him or one of our staff being certified to do this so that we could do it in-house so it wouldn't be so expensive? Well, one of the things that we've been talking about, this area would be too big and it's, what is it, nine cubic? Nine linear feet. Li not nine linear feet. Right. Um, right. Okay. And then if it's beyond that, you have to bring in a company. And so um, in Mabel Merritt, we do have some, some ceiling tiles that have asbestos in them. If you have a certified person, they could remove a ceiling tile, but they couldn't abate a whole project. But that would be helpful because there will be times we have to remove a ceiling tile. Instead of bringing a company in to remove a ceiling tile, we'll have somebody here that will know what to do. <coughs> and Mike's, I'm, I'm just glancing at Mike's memo. Um, did he get a report from Berger? Bruce Berger, yeah. Maybe He's if we can get a copy of the report, that'd be great. Yes. Just to okay. kind of tie it all together. And and he's comfortable with Berger versus somebody else? Yes, we've, we've used them on several projects. Okay. But, and um, Mike was very uh, aggressive in, in getting many different quotes and having the companies come back again. The quotes that, that he had gotten originally, you know, he picked me up off the floor after I saw them, and, <laughs> and then we talked about it. But um, he kept going back and having the companies come in, and uh, so he did Throw a good job on that. Sell them real like yeah. that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just a couple, a couple things Go back in the yeah. ring, Mike. Uh, peace officer, I imagine there may be outside funding opportunities to cover the cost of, of that. Uh, well, could, uh, will we? Could we get some information, you know, not tonight, but at some point before we make any decision about who we might go with us? Well, I th this is something that probably will come up in the budget cycle, so most of the conversation will occur at that point. Um, but I did look at potential funding through New York State, and there, there are grants in New York State for resource officers, but a district is eligible for the grant once, and we have already used our grant. And so we are not eligible for any state funding. Um, the funding that does exist through the Sheriff's Department for a resource officer, um, they pay 50% and the district pays 50%. And if it is a resource officer, the salary is uh, up with benefits is about 100000 So you pay half of the salary. They pay half of the salary. So even paying half of a resource officer is 50000 but if you hire a peace officer, it's um, 30000 or less. And since they are retired, they already have benefits. So 
it's substantially less. They are deputized by the Putnam County Sheriff's Department. They are not, they are not regular police officers. Um, they do carry weapons. Um, they are trained by the same group that trains the resource officers and um, they have the ability of being in a, a school district and working with the kids just in the same way as a resource officer. Okay, and there is an item on the agenda that we skipped, I think, about the Haldane Wireless Network, uh, a guest network for public access to board Oh, that docs. was just, it was this information about board docs? I skipped it by mistake, and I was going to get to it when she finished the report. <laughs> okay. I'm still fooling around with this board docs thing, and I'm not 100% comfortable with it. So that's my fault. But we will get to that. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I'll do it right now. So for those who are new, um, we have board docs, which is a agenda information management system where you can get everything that we get online through, uh, I think it's board docs com, but you can get it really through our district website. You just click it. Uh, there's two choices. There's the uh, confidential section, which is us, which is password protected uh, for confidential documents. And then there's the public site, which has probably 95% of everything that we get also. That doesn't need a password. Um, we are trying to get to the point where we get rid of these big stacks of paper and everybody can bring a smartphone, a iPad, a laptop, or whatever else, uh, and just access what we access right here in this room versus at home. Uh, and right now, I guess we have a temporary Haldane guest network that you can sign on. And the password, if anybody is interested at this point, is lowercase blue devils, I believe. Blue devils, no spaces, no caps. No spaces, no caps. And as we fine-tune that, um, we'll post it on the website and stuff. So eventually, people will show up with whatever wireless things they have, and then we'll slowly wean our 50, 60 pages pieces of paper down to a couple of simple pace, pieces of paper. How, how, is that guess, how does that work? Is that something that's turned on and off, like we turn it on for board meetings, kind of? It's a guest Wi-Fi that has limited access. Um, that you'll, you'll only really be able to just go to board docs. So um, a guest, someone here in the audience, if they have their device with them, they can sign on to the guest network to be able to get to board docs. But um, for security reasons and you know, student reasons, mm -hmm. it's going to be very limited as far as the access goes. Okay. So it's not like Starbucks. Well, I, that's what I was getting at. Does that mean like students could could access a wi the Wi-Fi system? No, it's so, no, it's just, just for to guest purposes, right. um, so that you could follow along at the meeting if you if you have the equipment to do it. Yeah, that sounds good. So we'll block everything except access to board docs. <coughs> yep. So that's what I forgot to tell you. Sorry. Anything else for Dr. Bowers on the report side? Um, committee minutes, Arts Booster Club, and I highly encourage people to read the Arts Booster Club minutes. They are doing some great, great stuff, uh, and really have kind of matured as an organization quick. Uh, that's unusual, uh, but they're doing a great job, so I encourage people definitely to read them. Uh, and then the Health and Safety Committee meeting from October 20th, and I have one question on that. Um, an issue came up with regards to the alarm system of a section of the district that it's not working. Any follow-up on that or I think it was three grand or something like that. There was a section of the main <laughs> building that um, the alarm hasn't been working. I'm not sure where we are with that. Um, I will follow up with Michael Yeah, we can that. maybe we for next meeting. Discussion. Any questions on minutes? Many of you guys? No? no. Okay. Uh, communication from the public on anything that we've talked about? Anything? Okay. Uh, correspondence, uh, H1. Uh, we have a letter from the Haldane Audit Committee. Uh, Mr. Tom Campanile, right? Campanile. Campanile. Uh, who's the chair of the audit committee. Peter actually read the letter at the last meeting, um, but we hadn't received the hard copies or 
some of us didn't. Um, so this is a copy of it. Um, it's on the board docs page. It's basically recommending that we uh, receive the audit. Um, Pete, do you want to? Pete and Evan are both audit committee people. Um, anything you want to add to it, or not? It's pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, nothing yeah. to add. We we talked about like last, last meeting. I think we were, we were, both, we're both very satisfied with everything that's uh, taking place. Yeah. Just to reiterate, we got an excellent rating from the auditor, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, two letter from the Putnam County Cemetery Committee, uh, which I didn't know there was a cemetery committee. Um, basically, this was addressed to the village mayor, um, and it was copied to the town board, school board, uh, local media, as well as attorneys for all of the above. And basically, there's been some conversations locally about the parking next to the cemetery along Cedar Street, uh, right next to where James Pond is. And basically, um, I guess they came through a determination that some boulders were moved inadvertently by the village and were potentially encroaching on potentially some property that belongs to the cemetery. So they just recently, as of Monday, I believe, moved the boulders to the edge of the street and there's no parking there. So the letter from the cemetery committee basically just reiterates that as well as a couple of other points. Uh, and just to remind people, because um, I got my head chewed off by some <laughs> high school seniors yesterday at uh, dismissal, uh, what did you do to my parking? And I reminded them that we were guests on those parking spaces. It's not school property. Um, I thought we were good guests, but uh, it wasn't our decision to remove it. And um, you know, when you're guests, you are subject to your hosts. So that was that. Um, the only thing I would suggest is maybe if we could just double check to make sure that the big boulders are in fact all on property that doesn't belong to the school and none of the boulders are on our property. Um, it would have been nice if this powwow that was had between all these committees had invited the school considering we were the basis of the conversation. But I know I didn't get an invite and I don't think you got one either. Uh, but I am gonna reach out to a few people and just see if we can maybe have a chat on site and just kind of We'll have to put, pull surveys because we have, there's, there is one area that's questionable where it looks like it could be our property, although it does border on the opposite side of the street and a cemetery there. Sure. Wasn't there a secondary benefit of the no parking there with the buses and the safety issue of that? The, no? Not that I recall. The buses coming in and out on Cedar Street, they didn't want the cars mm -hmm. there? Or no? Well, they were able, to, where the boulders were, they were far, the cars were far enough off the road that they weren't getting in the way of any of the buses. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think it would be helpful <coughs> for, for everybody if we have a little walkthrough with some representatives from, from the village to, to take a look at the site. Because based, <coughs> based on the property surveys, it looks like there's a pretty substantial uh, fringe of village property uh, on the side of the road that could it's quite adequate for, for uh, parking. If it's, if it's configured correctly and the cemetery site is adequately protected. So I, I have a feeling that uh, th we might get a little movement with, with, uh, with the right kind of a conversation. Well, I'll be happy to invite them in and set up a date for us all to have a conversation, anybody that'd like to. It sounds like there's more politics to this than... I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a village issue as far as, it, yeah. in my opinion. Yep. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, that's that. Uh, third, uh, we have a letter from Ms. Kerry Ann Ferry, I believe. Um, it was sent to us by email with regards to a first policy reading that we had last week, uh, which is actually on the agenda uh, a little later on. Um, and basically, in summation, uh, disagrees with the policy. And I don't know if, is Kerry here? Oh, you are, okay. Do you want to just quickly kind of summarize, if you, if you want? I mean, I, we got the letter, it's in the thing, and. Why I'm against Or just clarify what you, if you want. Um, in an educational setting. Terry, I'm 
Do you have any examples of uh, like like the cost of, of, of BOCES as compared to you know three or four independent evaluators? Like what like what is the do you have any Actually, examples? I, gonna, I, ask, I sent some questions to you, and that was one of the questions I had for you guys, which was, do you have a list of independent evaluators in the geographic area who will actually do an evaluation for the cap that you are setting? Because I, I happen to know that Yale is on the school list and they won't do one for that amount. So I was, you know, I was concerned with the, the cap that you had set. So you did, did, did you get the information I sent about what the other districts, local districts are doing in I, comparison? I, I did get the list okay. of districts that you had sent. However, I, I don't really, I didn't really understand why you were sending me those districts. You know, I mean, there's so many differences in those districts, some of them, which I am very familiar with. Some of those districts have awesome, you know, they're run by PhD psychologists with six behaviorists under them. Those districts probably don't need it. So there's just a lot of information um, that if you're not aware of what, what it actually is and what, how it can be beneficial and what it does, um, that just capping it at that amount is, you know, I just think it's wrong. <laughs> well, it's, my, it's my understanding, the independent evaluation is we do the evaluation and then if the family doesn't agree with the evaluation, they can then request an independent evaluation. So, I mean, I, I, I'm sure that we are confident in the evaluations that we do, but if people, of course, people have the right. No, uh, so, um, so, but it would be an interesting, there has to be some type of cap on it. If you just say you can have an independent evaluation, you have to have a cap because someone could go to the leading person in, in, the, in the United States, <laughs> you know what I mean, so you have, and say, here's the bill. But by federal law, there already is a regulation regulation is, you know, a reasonable amount for that geographic care. There is already a cap right. by law, so, so why the school needs one in addition to that, I'm not quite sure. And just to, you know, you did say, like, the school does the evaluation first, and, and that, is a, that is a very big part of it. I mean, so who does the evaluation here? And this is not meant to malign anybody in here, but I think we have, what, a school psychologist at our school who has, a, like, a provisional certificate right now? I mean, that there's no comparison. She can't even practice outside of the school setting between that evaluation and an evaluation that's done by someone with years of experience and expertise. Okay. okay. All right, thank you. I mean, we're going to go back to this um, a little bit later. Um, can I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just sure. along the way, well, I know we're going to talk about that, but with <laughs> letters, can I just make a, um, we, I think we talked about this a while ago, a couple of years ago. Um, can we have like an auto reply on the on the BOE Haldane um, email? Something that says like "Thank you very much um, for your letter." Um, please note that you know the, uh, these correspondence would be will be published in public agenda. Because I don't know if sometimes people like send a letter to the to the to the board of ed. They think they're just sending an email to the five of us, and maybe not necessarily realize that. It's a public document now. So if we could just make people aware of that, and this way if they get that email, they'll be like, oh, wait, I don't want the whole town to see my email, and they can call up and withdraw it or just say, please don't publish it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Do you know, it's great because I would, I mean, I know if I sent an email to, to the board, and I'm not even talking about this situation. I just happen to be. Um, if, I, if I sent an email, someone might send an email to us thinking they're sending it to the five of us, and then before they know it, their, their email is published all over town. It makes sense. I mean, we have a policy on correspondence. I mean, I'll pull the policy and see specifically what right, it says language-wise. Right, they might realize it when they just send right. us an email. Yeah, that's so worth looking at. So they get an order apply and that's the way they've been told that it's going to become public. Yeah, and I think typically the president responds to those letters, so it might even not be an auto reply, but in the response, just reminding, reminding them of that. Yeah. But this way, it's automatic, and they don't have to worry. They, they, whoever answers it doesn't have to remember to do that, or it's just. We and, and, and they can't, you know, it, they can't, someone can't say, well, no, I never got a response from, from them or, you know what I mean? He's on vacation for a week and, the, you know, it's like, this way it's automatic. They get the warning and, and it's out there. Well, there's, an, and our entire email system is public. And so people should be aware that right. anytime there's an email that's sent, it could, it's foilable and it's a public document and it's, you know, it's owned by the right. community. 
Okay, makes sense. So I'll pull the policy and see what specifically that says first, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, great. But thank you. Good comment. Uh, consent agenda I. Uh, board approval. The financial agenda. No, consent agenda, just the minutes. Okay. Any questions oh, minutes, on the okay, minutes? Sorry. October 7th, 21st? No. No? Motion? Motion. Second. Uh, any discussion? Further? All in favor? Aye. 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 Nay? None? Uh, consent agenda J, uh, financial. Motion? Motion. I'll second. Uh, discussion? Uh, I think Peter uh, requested that we pull J2, yeah. the approval of the warrants. We are in a transition from our former claims auditor, who is now our district clerk, and the law doesn't allow the clerk to be the claims auditor, and our new claims auditor, who's going to start after we appoint her in about 10 minutes. So there's a little gap. So Peter wants to defer that to the next meeting, which makes perfect sense. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, consent agenda financial polling J2. We'll do that one at the next meeting. Uh, any other questions other than thank you to the School Foundation for increasing their robot donation, uh, which sounded pretty cool when I read it. All in favor? Aye. 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 None. Uh, opposed, none. Uh, consent agenda personnel K. Motion? Motion. A second. Uh, discussion? Uh, we have our work. I have a question about number four with the appointment of, for coaches for the spring sports season. So if we decide then to do an assistant track coach, that'll be kind of in a secondary. Right. We'll add a, an Just additional. An additional. Yeah. Okay. And welcome to the new claims auditor, uh, Ms. Susan Hutter. Hutter, who actually is the business official at Garrison. Yes. So that's a nice little tie-in. Um, she seems qualified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I would say so. Uh, all in favor? A lot of training. Aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? None. Uh, unfinished monolith solar update. The never-ending monolith solar update. Sure. What's uh, new? Well, you know, there was a lot of questions about that 18 month and when we started. So I went digging in my records and I made a little timeline that I just like to share with everyone um, so that you see just how, how long the process is and when the, the clock started ticking at SED. So um, just in summary, um, in February of 2013, is when um, the district started talking about solar and um, we'd received some a proposal some other proposals um, but the one that stuck out that we were interested in pursuing was a proposal from monolith solar and in march of 2013 um, a representative from the company uh, came to a board meeting i think it was here in this room and they made a presentation um, in june 2013, the Board of Ed approves the power purchase agreement and authorize the superintendent to sign the documents and get the process rolling with SED. In September of 2013, the letter of intent was sent to SED. Uh, interconnection applications were sent to Central Hudson and specs were developed. March of 2013, the um, SED applications were signed by the district and submitted to SED in April of 2013. 2014, I'm sorry, yes, thank you. Um, so in 2014, uh, in April was actually when that 18 month clock started ticking at SED. <laughs> so that's uh, more than a year after we had had the initial presentation and just going through a lot of uh, documentation to get the specs to come here it took a long time for the the company to come here and evaluate our our buildings and what we wanted done and to size the different types of um all right one minute i'll talk fast um so um in october 
just last month of 2014, um, there were more documents that had to be prepared by Monolith because um, SED did have some comments. Um, the system has been upgraded to use larger panels and inverters, so now our application um, has been resumed at SED um, just this month because we replied to comments that SED had. So it's, it's not lost or forgotten. It's uh, moving through. Before you have your questions, which I assume you do, <laughs> I want to just change the tape. I was done. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, I'm sure you have questions. <laughs> just uh, thanks for summing that up for us. So uh, based on what you've told us, I think uh, our 18 months won't actually be up until fall of next year. Uh, but, right. but hopefully we can uh, yeah. put a little fire under. I think we have the person's phone number up at SED oh, now, right? We so have we can, all kinds we can of check in with them now. and right. move things along, hopefully. Yes. Yeah, friends. Good. I know. Joe, Joe and I met the uh, Monolith Solar uh, representatives at the NISBA conference last week, and they they knew exactly who we were, knew our yes, names. They uh, so. said, "Oh yeah, we were just talking about you guys. We had just so we're in their we're in their heads." So our confidence with SED is always on the lower end. Are we still okay with Monolith as a provider, vendor? You guys still good with everything they're doing and their delivery and they're happy, you're happy with them? Well, I'm just coming into it, so okay. I, but I can tell you that uh, they seem to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. They do, and they respond in great detail when we ask them. I think that they were just waiting as well, and the comments um, from SED were in late September, so it was a timely response because there were documents that they had to fill out and specs that they had to prepare and um, also get in contact with Central Hudson. It's not just like, oh, you know, I'm going to flip this over in a day. There are other uh, entities that have to be involved in, in the project, so they're, um, they're timely with their okay. responses. Good. Great. And Peter had actually a great idea today, which I'm going to hold him to, uh, of maybe approaching Monolith when we get a little further down the track of some type of educational kind of display as part of this whole thing that has high visibility, which I think would be a great idea. So I'm going to hold you to that as we get further on. <laughs> yeah, we even had a funding source for that too, which uh, the idea would be the use of 15000 from the from, from from the heating study that wasn't conducted. I think uh, everybody, everybody in that organization would be happy to see it put to that kind of a purpose. And one of the things we liked about Monolith, actually, when we spoke to them initially, was uh, they really, they like to engage with the, the schools that they, they do business with. And, uh, and creating those uh, little uh, high visibility uh, components of the project is something that they've done for other schools in the past. So. Uh, it, it could be something very small. It might just be four or six panels. But they, 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 they showed us some pictures of how they build some nice frameworks, and you can, and you can put it in, uh, like, near an entranceway to the school and tie it up to a monitoring system so that everybody uh, becomes educated as to the purpose of the, the system and, and what it's doing for us. Good. Great. Didn't they have something where you went right on, I think, his iPad, and he was patched into another yeah. another district or another uh, one that yeah. was a, and showed us the monitoring and yeah. uh, you know that could be real really good and educational tool good so that's your project you got that. that's on your list mr. Anderson okay great um, communication from the public on anything since the last time just a little bit about um, what we've done and kind of who we are. And we updated our mission statement this year. So I'm giving you guys the abridged version. Um, I think I'm going to stop missing your packet. Thank you. Anyway, we can have it again. Um, I just wanted to take the opportunity to just talk a little bit. Um, 
uh, from a parent's perspective, and I know, for instance, that um, Carrie brought up the idea of the independent evaluations, and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but I wanted to let you know briefly, you know, who we are, who we advocate for, and um, and why we think these kinds of issues are important to discuss, perhaps more thoroughly. Um, we are parents of children who learn differently, obviously. And just to let you know, none of us expected to be in this position. When you have a child, you assume that kid is going to be brilliant. <laughs> and many of our children are brilliant. Um, but what you don't expect are the struggles that are associated with parenting a child who doesn't learn the same way that most children do. Um, our children fall outside the norm. It's the bell curve. And um, I assume all of you are parents. And I don't know, maybe your children fall within that bell curve. Um, but when they fall outside of that curve, it makes it difficult to help them. And it makes it difficult for you as a parent to feel like you belong in a community sometimes. Um, there's, there's issues you have um, financially with your child too, needing additional services, additional support. Socially, it can be a little isolating too if you don't find other parents who are going through the same thing that you are. Um, so I just want you to think about that if you haven't been in that position, what it can be like because learning differences, disabilities, special needs, they don't discriminate. It can happen to anyone at any point in time and um, that child needs their parents' support and they need the support of the community too. So that's what we're kind of about and you guys can read the mission statement and all of that. Um, and there's another page attached, you can look at the second page, which is a graphic that I really love and I thought I would share with you guys, um, which I like to call leveling the playing field, that as parents of kids who learn differently, we're really not asking for more for our kids than what any child at Haldane would get. What we're asking is that the playing field be leveled in such a way that they have the same access and the same opportunities to education. So this really cute graphic, shows you that like if we treat everyone the same way even though we know they're all different and they learn differently and their brains work differently then we're really not giving them equal access but if we support them in the way that they need support then all of a sudden everyone is equal in their access to education um, and that's why these kinds of policy changes are really important to us um, in terms of the one regarding independent educational evaluations because sometimes you have a kid who uh, nobody understands. Nobody gets how their brain works. And it takes a team of specialists to really tear it apart and figure out what are going to be the best supports to give that child access to education. And Haldane is a really small school district, so we don't have super specialists here on staff. How could we? You know, we're not a big district. We, don't, we know how you guys struggle with the budget. Um, so sometimes you really do have to look outside to understand how your kid learns. And um, you know we're concerned that if we start capping that, we're, we're going to, in a sense, make it that much more difficult for families who don't have the financial means to get an independent evaluation, to get one that maybe their child really does need. Um, and uh, I don't know what Garrison does, but I was surprised on the list of school districts that we were kind of looking at in terms of financial caps. I didn't see Garrison on there, and they seem to be the most comparable to us in terms of size as to do they do this too? Do they have a cap? Do they follow BOCES? Um, so I'd be curious to hear more about you know, what they do. Um, and I guess just in conclusion, we know you guys have a really difficult job. <laughs> I don't envy any of you having to balance a budget and you have to consider the needs of all of your students. Um, but as a parent, it's my job to also remind you to please consider those students who fall outside the norm, who perhaps are in the minority. Uh, you know, we're, we're concerned about having those extra track students get that extra coach. You know, I, I get it. And if my kid was one of those track students, I'd be concerned about that too. Um, so moving forward, you've got the strategic plan coming up. We're looking at Haldane for the next 10 years ahead. I just want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes, which is by Gandhi, and I've kind of rewritten it a little bit for you. Um, Gandhi's quote says, not that I'm trying to, you know, rewrite Gandhi. We wrote Gandhi? Uh, <laughs> sorry, no, that, that came across wrong. No, no, no. That's my learning difference, apparently. Um, 
the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. So I would like to amend that and say, the true measure of any school district can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable students, those that fall outside the norm, who are the minority, and who are exceptional in more ways than one. So please do not forget about them. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So if I could follow up, I know that I got an email um, recently about the potential of having a meeting with the Learning Differences Group um, for the strategic plan. And I believe it was from you, Carrie, wasn't it? Not? Yeah. So um, we are more than happy to, to do that. Jen and I talked about it today. So if there's a time or a place you'd like to do that, we'll be there. So just let us know when you're going to have your next meeting. When does your group meet? Like how often? I mean, we're not a, a so it's not like, board of ed, you know, right, it's so not it's like wellness that has an, an official kind of meeting schedule. It's more based on, you know, our membership and when we're planning for the school year. And, and our, our work schedules. And work schedules. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I too wanted to just say something about independent um, educational evaluations. So I do have a child, my oldest child, who had difficulty in school, and of course it was very difficult to figure out what it was. It's this, it's that, he doesn't have a disability. Coming into the school 10 or 15 times knowing that he's very different. And I think that um, the best thing that happened for us was getting an independent educational evaluation. And the truth is I didn't go through the school, I did go to the best person that I could find because my family had the resources to do that. And because I was able to find him, I still use him and his staff as a consultant for my child and will be using him probably all through college and all through maybe his children and my grandchildren, I'm not really sure. Um, feels like I'll be paying for that forever. And I'm willing to do that. And I think the beautiful part of that was it gave me the language and the deep understanding of my child so that not only do I have it for my family, but it allowed me to explain it to the teachers, to the school, to say, hey, look, this is how my kid learns and that was such an important piece of it because without the language nobody knows what to do and also I think that some of these valuations are written so beautifully that they are almost like a graduate course for the special education department here you read through them and when you hear a particular diagnosis because they can't give a diagnosis here we always have to go outside the school to get a, di a specific diagnosis so there's always a process that happens with that it's not just we get the educational evaluation here everything is very clear we bring it to the classroom teacher and then it's translated in how that child learns. It isn't. More interpretation, more expertise is often needed in that, and it gives us the language and the ability to do that. And I think that sometimes it is more clear cut, and it needs one or two interventions, and sometimes it just isn't that clear cut. And it's terribly devastating for the child. It's devastating for the teacher often in the classroom because they don't know what to do with that child, and it's really devastating for the family. So I think, you know, yes, I can get the educational evaluation. In fact, I brought my person here to the school and I set people up so that they can talk with him for free for an hour on Thursday mornings, he does that. So, you know, we can also give resources to people who are here who may not be able to afford it. But really this hurts people who can't do anything or people who have tremendous expense in their house. If you have a child with a significant disability, it is so not only costly to you emotionally, but costly to you financially. And if you don't really take care of these children early on and spend a little bit of money in this time, at, during this time, so that you can really understand them, especially in a school system like this where we can communicate from year to year to year, the kindergarten through the 12th grade, then you're gonna pay a lot more money later on because they're not gonna be able to be employable. They're gonna be bigger problems. So I urge you to consider that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other? Communication? Questions? Okay. Uh, new business N1. Julia, this is where you come in. Uh, this is the CSE CPSE recommendations, and the recommendation is that the board approves the recommendations by the Committee on Special Education and Preschool Special Education as indicated. Uh, motion? Motion. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Uh, N2. This is the acceptance of the external audit of the financial statements of the Haldane Central School District of Phillipstown for the year ended June 30th, 2014. The recommended action is that the Board of Education accepts the recommendation of the Haldane Audit Committee courtesy of Mr. Thomas Campanile, Chair 
to accept the external audit of the financial statements of the Haldane Central School District for this year ended June 30th, 2014, as presented by Scott Prisser, CPA of Raymond G. Prisser, CPA, PC, Claverack, New York. Motion. Motion. Second. Uh, discussion, comment? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Tom and the Audit Committee. Peter, Evan, thanks again, guys. Uh, and three. Uh, this is just an acknowledgement of a donation from the Monfort Group blocks for the concession stand, and the recommend ac recommended action is that the Helding Board of Education expresses their sincere thanks and appreciation to the Montfort Group, 44 Elm Street, Fishkill, New York, 12524, for their generous donation of 2,000 concrete blocks valued at $4,400 for the Haldane School concession stand. Great. We don't have to motion second for that one, right? No. Okay. Uh, thank you, Montford Group uh, and the Montford Brothers, I believe, uh, and Dan Hughes also for facilitating that donation. Uh, and four. Okay. This is for the establishment of a petty cash account for the in the extracurricular activity fund, and the recommended action is that the Board of Education establishes a petty cash fund in the amount of $50 for the Student Council account in the extra, extra Classroom Activity Fund. This will be added to the list of petty cash funds established at the annual reorganization meeting. Uh, motion? Motion. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, and five? This is the for the approval of a side letter of agreement between the Board of Education and the Haldane Faculty Ap Association, an amendment to Haldane APPR. Wait, oh, you skipped one. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> this is the second reading. Um, we're looking for approval for the amendment to Board Policy 7680, the Independent Educational Evaluations. The recommended action is that the Board of Education approves the amendment to Board Policy 7680 Independent Educational Evaluations. Uh, motion. Motion. Second. Uh, discussion. We heard some public comment on it. We got a letter. Um, well, I mean, we we could do. Could we get readings. some more information as far as? Um, you know the points that 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 are being raised i mean what are we talking about as far as like what would it cost if we if we created a scenario of an evaluation that was needed what would bosi's charge and what would you know a, a, an evaluator in the area charge and could we so we kind of get do we have that kind of information like what are we is there a, a giant gap I mean, is it, is it, are we talking hundreds of dollars? Are we talking thousands of dollars? It probably depends on the doctor. I, think that I can, I can yeah. ask Jen um, to give us an analysis of the ones that we have had com and compare and contrast. And she's done a few, um, but it's, we can ask. I don't know. We have had very few actually in the district. Right. I mean, so. I think that's also interesting, I, though, the <coughs> idea of, We've only, I mean, it's my understanding that we've only had, I mean, I think Jen said there's only been three or something, you know, three independent evaluations in six years or something. But, you know, so my question about that is, that to me makes it seem like that people don't do independent evaluations very much, that it's not that big of an issue. But from what I'm hearing here, that's not, right. that's it's not, not the case. That, so not to say that we won't get six next year. Well, well, Jen did. I asked Jen. I asked her. I, I, I think she said that there was two or three in the last couple of years. So, so I, I think that's what her response. Have her email. I, I have the response. But, but I, I would suggest. I mean, you know, we, we we've gone this long. Like, why not? We can go another two weeks or a month. Um, if we if we got if we if we got those rates, so we can say, okay, this is what BOCES would charge. This is what 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 three or four evaluators in the area would charge. And, and see where the discrepancy is. I still think, I mean, I still think that y y there should be some a clear guideline. Um, you know, even if you want to, you know, if, if we see that, the, we'll see what the numbers are. You can even talk about a percentage over 
you know, you can say no more than 10% over what BOCES charges or 20, whatever it is, you know, so at least maybe we have some more information before we, we finalize it. Does that sound right, yeah. fair? Yeah, so I think based on the input that we received, mm -hmm. that we would be wise to do a little more uh, research on this before we uh, do anything, take any action. Uh, I, I do think that uh, we, we, it is entirely appropriate to cap it at some level, but I think we need to uh, do uh, you know, what Evan suggested and get a little more information before we... And then we can make that public and then give you know, anyone who wants to an opportunity to maybe if they don't agree with the numbers that we're getting, to bring different numbers and we can look at everything and, and we can go from there. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of agree. I think, you know, it, yes, if, if things continue, maybe it's not as big a deal. Um, but, you know, what if you get six next year and they're all $50,000 each? You know, where are we going to get that money from? Um, you know, again, I don't know how much they cost. I'm just making that number up. I didn't mean that someone's charged $50,000 for it. Um, I, I feel that I, I get where you're coming from. I've been through it twice with my two sons, so I, I know exactly what you're you're, you're talking about. Um, you know, and again, if, if 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 we don't cap it, I'm just at some point. I don't know what you know. I know you mentioned that the federal guidelines say it's re a reasonable rate. All right, well, who's all right, who, who gives us that actual dollar amount of what reasonable equals in our area? You know, um, I think we have to find a way to cap it at some level, and I don't know what that level is, but. Yeah. So if I'm hearing correctly, we will defer to a third reading. Uh, we'll do that at the next business meeting. And basically between now and then, we'll do some more homework, and um, I get to digest all this stuff, because this is new to me, which I'm looking forward to. Who chairs the committee or the group? OK. So like, like ba basically, like if we create a scenario, so if we needed an evaluation of a third grader with, you know, whatever the scenario is, evaluation, we call up OCs and we say, how much would you charge us? Then we do some research and call up some other eva independent evaluators and say, what would they charge for that same evaluation? And now we can see what, is there really a big discrepancy? And then where do we go from there? And tapping into what Garrison does, if that wasn't on the list, I don't remember. Corey brought up, that's a, certainly interesting to know what another smaller school district allows for. Right. And their CSC for the younger students is done in Garrison and for the older students is done here. Right. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Okay. Evan, can I appoint, delegate, assign, order you to be the point person for the board on this? Because you seem to have obviously sure. I mean, a I'll, professional I'll knowledge. I mean, if, if I'll even make the call if you want to make the call. Well, you work with Dr. Bowers Dr. and Dr. Bowers, and if you call Dr. <laughs> if you email them saying that I'm going to call and request the information, that would be. And so I'll, I'll contact you tomorrow and we'll go over okay. it. Okay. And, I, you know, my guess is probably somewhere there's a, a database with that information in it. Okay. So we, we may be able to get that at both right. okay. okay. Yeah, so I'll do the job. All right, good. Thanks. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, where are we? And so are you, excuse me, are you withdrawing your motion to approve this? Well, the motion was to discuss it. The motion was. So we're going to go to a third reading. We're going to go to a third reading. Okay. Uh, the next business meeting. Okay. December 2nd. Is that right? Still with us then? So my guess is you probably want to put December 2nd on your calendars, not to <laughs> speculate. <laughs> but, and I'm sure we'll be in communication at some point between then. Yep. OK. Uh, and six. OK, well, now we'll get to the side letter agreement. Approval of side letter agreement between the BOE uh, Board of Education and the Haldane Faculty Association Amendment to the Haldane APPR. And the recommended action is that the Board of Education approves the attached side letter agreement with the Haldane Faculty Association related to an amendment in the Haldane APPR and authorizes the board president and superintendent to side this, sign this side letter of agreement on behalf of the district. Uh, motion? Motion. Oh, second. Uh, discussion? 
It looks to me as though this is uh, simply a matter of a date change. Right. Uh, and putting <coughs> dates in so there are specific times that everybody expects things to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Uh, and seven, first reading of Board Policy 7330. So I... Yeah, you should probably uh, give some. Okay. Um, we are in the process of taking a number of our policies, and you'll be seeing this on a regular basis. Um, right now, we're, we're starting to bring to the surface the policies that are being discussed, and we're taking a look at the policies that we have, and we're, we're modifying them. Um, to meet the needs of the district right now. We're going to be looking at, at the policy, our entire policy manual, over the next probably three years. And um, about every six months, we'll take a chapter, we'll read through all the policies, we'll make um, uh, changes and amendments on the policies. And so um, the second policy that we're talking about um, this evening really is a, a policy about the interface between a school district and the police department and what happens in school and what is allowed and what is not and um, how the, the regulations um, that are um, in, in education law and the interface between education law and penal law which is very different and so we've we've taken a number of different policies and merged them. Um, Peter, I know you sent the NISBA <coughs> policy. Most of the information that we would want embedded in our policy was already in it. And so I did a cross-reference of the two. There were certain things um, that just don't match our district. There was a, an example was um, about the, the requirements of what would happen in a strip search. Our policy doesn't allow for strip searches. And so if you're talking about more, um, if, if we were in any inner city school or one that had different types of issues in our student body, um, reflects, then it may be something we'd want to consider, but it was not something that I think belongs in, in our group. So there are uh, our policy, the one that is written here, it, the black um, lettering is the prior policy, the red lettering that is in here is the new um, amendments to the policy, which will happen all throughout the policy. So. Uh, if you have any questions on um, any of the new information, I'll be happy to answer it. So the stuff in red here, uh, presumably you've, I, I know you shared with us earlier the, the uh, policy from your previous di district. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I imagine some of this is taken from there, but that was probably sourced from either NISBA or Irubosis in the first place? Well, it would be through some a labor relations department of BOCES, so it depends. Many, um, many of the districts or the BOCES share their labor relations departments, so this was actually a merging of multiple labor relations suggestions as well as from NISBA. So in terms of a sample policy from uh, Erie BOCES provides us with uh, policy updates yes. and you had indicated that you put in a request yep. that to them for their sample policy, so and we're waiting to receive that. We are. Uh, <coughs> so I think, uh, you know, I think we're, we're he I'm, uh, thanks uh, for bringing this policy to our attention because uh, now that we have a chance to go and look at our policy as it exists on the books today, it's clear that it is quite inadequate. Uh, so it, it definitely needs our attention. Uh, I just want to make sure we step carefully and we have a proper framework for evaluating uh, the, the proposals here. So we have, if we have a sample policy from uh, Irubosis and another one from NISBA to, to look at as our framework for reference, and I think we'd be in great shape for uh, moving this ahead. Right. And, and many of the things that, were, that you saw within the NISBA policy was in the modifications already, so that's good. Typically, does our um, Erie BOCES, I mean, I assume, has their own legal department? Labor se. relations department. Okay. Mm -hmm. But at some point, we'll want to have our attorney uh, review this, I think, before we uh, take any final action. Uh, just to For all the policies? No, 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 just the, this, this, one. this one in particular, okay. because I did notice in the, in the NISPA sample policy that, it, that there were numerous uh, warnings that you, that you really should uh, consult closely with your attorney uh, on this, just to make sure that the language is, is crystal clear and appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with 
history, there's some, it's, it's definitely a sensitive policy. And the difference between the policy and the regulation, I think most people are, they live in the regulation world where we sometimes live in a policy world. Regu policy first, regulation second. Um, is it even worth looking what our current regulations are because our policy is well, once the policy full of holes, it's not even worth looking at the regulations? It is, but generally you look at the regulation um, after the policy's been approved. Okay, so there's no reason to even glance at what our existing regulations are. And, and is that will be something that will be modified during the um, update process, which will start in January. Okay. Okay. So there's a lot in here, obviously, and it's a lot of legalese um, that needs some thorough digesting, I know, on my part. Um, okay. So we got first reading. We're going to get Erie Bosey's version of something similar. Um, and we also have, I mean, one of the things that we have now with board docs is we can go in and we can look at other districts' policies. So that we have that database yeah, available to us now. Yeah, I was going to suggest that because I did it the old-fashioned way. I went to dobbsferryschool.com. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this obviously makes a lot more sense, and it's probably worth doing. And I'll take the lead on that and pulling up half a dozen districts of like-minded places and mm -hmm. see what they have to say. Similar demographics. Yeah. Yep. Yep. yep, and I'll do that. And is this something the safety committee will kind of weigh in on as well, or is this just a board? Well, this has already been distributed to the safety committee. Okay. But the, there have been changes since we distributed it, the first version to them. So, and, and that was more for reflection and suggestions. And then we'll embed any suggestions into the policy, which will come to you. And this may, we, I mean, it's very, possible we could approve one now and then approve it again in six months and make additional changes. So, um, you know, you can modify them as often as necessary. Okay. So step one of a lengthy process. Okay. Um, eight, Smart Schools Bond Act discussion, which ends in 23 minutes. Someone will decide this whether we do. So basically, rather than go through the whole Q&A on this, because in 23 minutes it's mm -hmm. beyond that point. Right. Um, so what happens is if it fails, it's a moot issue. It's no longer of discussion. Right. If it passes, then the district is required to create a plan with stakeholder, staff, board approve, uh, input. And then that plan has to be approved by the agency that's in charge of the Smart School Bond Act. Right. Did I get all that? And at this point, we really don't have any guidance, and Ann and I were discussing this earlier sure. today. At, at once, if, if and when it does get approved, um, then the guidance will come out. And this is really being approved through the governor's office, and then there'll have to be a link between the governor's office and state education um, department so we can get guidance on how we have to proceed for this. Do we know, if, let's say it does pass, and we apply for it and get it, that <laughs> You know, Cuomo's going to pull his usual tricks and say, oh, but if you take the money, you also got to do this, this, and this. That's very possible. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so just something to be aware of. And one of the fears, and this is actually it, my 11 years of being around this world, uh, this is one of the first times that I've seen a school funding thing that didn't get overwhelming, enthusiastic response from the school community meaning all the associations, the lobby groups, and everything was kind of mixed. And I think there is some legitimate concern, and we, I think, heard it at the School Board Association conference, that this passes, this gives the governor and some of his supporters an excuse to not address any other legitimate school funding issues like gap elimination uh, and all the other foundation aid. And you got your $2 billion, now keep quiet and stop whining is kind of the way I heard it. And that really is of concern. Um, and that's, I think, why it's been kind of mishy-mashy as far as people saying, yay, we want the money. Because be careful what you ask for. So I guess we'll see. Okay. Uh, nine. I think we're on nine. Nine, we actually said that we were going to defer that to the next meeting, and Tom was going to do his diligence and sharpen the pencils and stuff like that. 
Did I get that right? Okay. 10, non-resident tuition past practice. Dr. Bauer, I'll defer you to that one. Yep. Um, we have um, a couple of different situations related to uh, tuition and um, w we have a, a request coming from a parent that will be out of the Haldane district for a short period of time that would like us to consider um, how we would handle tuitioning a student and there has been some past practice uh, where students have been allowed to stay in and um, Anne went through and, and did a an analysis of w periods of time in which students should have or could have left the district and attended a different district but remained here and tuition was paid and that was done at the rate that we're charging Garrison That's correct. and um, if there was prorated for whatever reasons that would be done there but th this was a request that came from a parent for us to look at um, whether or not a child could stay before they moved to Garrison and then came back so um, that would that looks as if the answer um, will be very clear that it, they would have to pay the tuition at the Garrison rate and not at a higher rate um, which is the Seneca Falls rate which um, is also a consideration for tuition so this is you know that the, the request came through so this is something we thought we should discuss at this meeting and I don't know if you have any thoughts or questions but it looks like that's what past practice has allowed for is that for this school year or for next year oh, for next year yeah and there's a gap year before the child would be coming back in mm -hmm. to Haldane is that is that past practice just that they move to Garrison or if they move to the, anywhere out of District. It can be anywhere, um, and the child, for whatever the reason, there's an agreement that the child okay. stays here. And at the garrison rate, though, not at the Seneca Falls Correct. rate. I don't know. Can you. I'm trying to word it correctly, so. Is there a way of. I mean, it's, these kinds of things tend to have a case by case basis mm -hmm. especially when you have all these circumstances that factor into it specifically on this one right. and you know the kid has been here for eight years basically is going to have a gap of nine months and then is going to come back for four years and graduate and stand on the the knoll and everybody's going to cry and all that kind of stuff the way that we could somehow be compassionate without setting legal standards that comes back to haunt us in the world of legalities mm -hmm. something like that to me would be reasonable right and that would be something that we would have to put into policy right and so that would have to be something that is decided by the board and it could be it could be by application and a case-by-case -case basis circumstances um, that would be included or considered in the decision-making I mean, especially if there's, you know, no out-of-pocket, if, you know, it's just strictly being, I won't say good people, but it's good school policy, I think. You know, if it's a short-term situation. Obviously, you don't want to create a legal precedent that somebody says, you know, I, I have to stay here, but I'm going to stay here forever, and you've got me forever, that kind of thing. Right. I mean, if this has defined parameters and they can be documented and verified and double checked it seems to me to be a reasonable way to run a school district but that's just me what's the difference in the rates the two rates the Seneca versus the garrison it's 12,000 and change for the garrison and 20 was it 21 close to that it, um, for the Seneca Bowl. it varies a bit each year but it's it's substantial difference if, if we have someone just hypothetically from I don't know pick a town Carmel that wants to go to Haldane for some reason in sixth grade but still live in Carmel can they do that at the Seneca Falls rate well that would be that we'd have to make that decision okay. and right now we don't have anything that's solidified and if there you know I, I think what we were talking about or what Joe was talking about is if there's unusual life circumstances right. yeah I'm just saying this is a lot different than someone who just you know just never been here right. all of a sudden out of the blue decide oh I want to go to that school you know that, that yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more along the lines of someone who's got a history yeah. that got to a point 
an external factor kicked in yep. and there's a temporary interruption of continuity which probably in a case like this would be great for it and needed rather than another disruption just my thought how so do we make it work i don't yeah, know i'm happy some to sort of hardship application like to apply for leniency or a waiving of tuition because of uh, hardship and then there would have to be like a i don't know what kind of application that is but you know and then somebody making those decisions i guess that's us but um yeah something it seems like, that. like if there is hardship to then create more hardship by making it not possible financially perhaps for a kid to continue in school uh, doesn't seem doesn't and seem like the right educational choice. And I think we'd want to put a limit on the length of time that would happen. Yeah, I mean. to reapply or something if it went outside of that limit. So would one school year? I'm thinking one school year. That's what I was yeah. thinking. Um, yeah, I think if, what, if, if we're going to make accommodations like that, they, there has to be very, very so strict be, limits right, on this. And, right. and, and, and just you would be the absolute then, top set. Because yeah, no right. And certainly it, it would be contingent upon the actual Circumstances, and you made us aware of the, the circumstances in this particular case. Uh, I think we all, well, I think we, we want to be as accommodating as we can, but we, we also can't uh, part from uh, past practice. Uh, so, right. Unless we create some kind of appeal process that has a limit on it and they can appeal it to the board. So, how about if I volunteer to draft some? <laughs> language that may or may not work and I'll work with you and see if we can come up with something that we can then circulate. And maybe we can call Mike as well. Yeah, and maybe just get him on the phone and say, listen, here's an right. intent. How do right. we do it? Meeting requirements of law that we don't put ourselves in a bucket that we can't get out of. Yep. And Sounds I'll probably good. take, Corey, your quote that you took from Gandhi because it does kind of fit in this thing. So I'm really taking your quote where you took. Yeah, so I'm adjusting your quote where you took Gandhi's quote. So I think we're good. <laughs> Does that all make sense? Yeah. Okay. Next one, do you want me to continue with that? Yep. Okay. Um, we were having a conversation with our administrative council as we were preparing for the beginning of the strategic planning uh, com groups, and um, there was a request or a discussion about um, the percentage of focus in the strategic plan that was directly related to teaching and learning, which was one out of the f of five categories. So we talked about whether or not we were meeting the spirit of what was intended within the strategic plan, and there was a request that we add a sixth category that is related to everything that we um, have been working on with the state and um, the Common Core and all the other things that are, are kind of coalescing around us right now. And so the request is that we add a sixth category of college, career, and city citizenship readiness as one of this, the subcommittees within the strategic plan. So instead of having five, we'll have six. Was there any fear that that would overlap with teaching and learning? It should overlap with teaching it and should. learning. Yeah. Okay. And so the, I think that there's, um, but it's it's what t this these are the kind of the commencement outcomes in all three of these areas that we're looking for, and our teaching and learning has to be directly correlated with what they are. Okay. Sounds good to me. My only fear is that we end up with uh, <coughs> so many subcommittees that we need another committee to manage the subcommittee. We get to the, the point where the management of the whole thing uh, becomes more challenging than the actual uh, conducting of, of the work. Uh, I, 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 my inclination is that we want to keep the number of categories down as, as much as is reasonably possible. But this is an actual yeah. charge that if you look at the any of the, the wording and the charges that have been given to the school districts from the state education department, this is the primary charge. And it is, and it right now is not being reflected in the strategic plan. Yeah, I mean, it does seem as though this is really the, the, the primary o overarching goal as we approach the, the strategic plan. Yeah. And to subordinate it to a subcommittee then might be doing it an injustice. Uh, <clears throat> so what are you suggesting? Uh, 
Well, what do we have for, what are our five uh, domains uh, currently? Well, it's teaching and learning, um, it's extracurricular activities, um, facilities, finance, and, and branding. So, yeah, it could. I mean, if you've got 25 people, and I'm hoping that number grows as people become more comfortable and put their arms around the importance of this, um, you know, if you have 35 people over the course of six, that's six plus your administrators, mm -hmm. you know, you've got workable committees. Right. They're not these, you know, bureaucratic big groups that don't get anything done. And, and the way that we're looking at designing it, we're probably looking at an overall um, art um, umbrella committee of everybody that, that exists within the subcommittees. Um, having an, the, the meetings beginning with the large committee breaking into subcommittees and then coming back and reporting out and then doing the next part. So um, it's not that there's, there will be a degree of cross-referencing when you have the big umbrella committee um, working together, but for the most part they're, they're all focused in a specific region. Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to see this sixth category is not overlapping with all of the existing five categories yeah. and, they're, and therefore, you know, people duplicating effort or treading on each other's toes. Well, one of the uh, things we were talking about at our meeting, um, our parent meeting, was the fact that um, we have to be, we as, an ed as all educators in New York State, have to be much more explicit in the commencement outcomes that we're requiring for our students. And we have to actually provide some kind of um, basis and document and information to, to students to, so they realize this is one of the things we're expecting them to achieve during their time here. And so when they walk across the stage, there has to be some measurement of achievement within um, that area. And so as we're looking at some of the changes that are being made at the State Education Department right now, they're looking at adding additional areas that are, of, that are much more related to student interests than they are the traditional kind of regions curricula. And they're talking about the new regions exams. And this will all be part of the commencement outcome and the college and career readiness. But I can tell you that the administrators in your district are saying that we need an additional committee. So. Well. I'm not going to stand in the way then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we're going to do outreach, right, to get more people involved? Yes, we And are. I'm assuming everybody here is going to participate in this process because you're here, because you care. Many of are, yeah. I would highly recommend it. I was on the last strategic plan committee, and I was then a civilian community member, I guess. And it was a great experience, and it gave you a chance to really put your arms around things that you don't usually deal with because you're talking to people that you don't always communicate with. And it was a great experience. It really, really was worth it. So I encourage everyone here, if you're not, get involved. And the time commitment's not astronomical, mm -hmm. uh, but it's also a good way to, you know, participate and help the district. So I'm encouraging everybody to participate. And if there's anybody out there that would like to to call in and let us know that you have an interest, we're accepting names. So sign up, because there's probably a good chance you're going to hear from me if you don't. <laughs> okay. Next. Okay. So, um, just so um, it's more of a precursor to what we should expect at the next board meeting, but we've been, we've been talking a little bit about some sports injury protocols, and Tom Cunningham is putting together some information that he'll be sharing with us at the next meeting. So um, that it's underway. There, there have been discussions about some of the protocols that we presently use in the district that many parents don't know that we're using in the district. And there's a lot that's being done. And uh, one of the common themes you're going to hear throughout the strategic plan is the fact that we don't necessarily tell our story all that well, and that one of our goals is to to start telling our story so people understand all the things that's, that are being done within the district, one of which is a lot of things to protect kids and keep them safe in relationships to sports. So that will be coming. Great. And could you just mention to Tom if he could touch base on that impact testing? Yes, that's part of it. And the whole benchmarks and how that works? That's all part of it. Good. It's going to be sharing next time. Uh, rate of pay per diem substitutes? 
There have been um, requests that have come both within the district and um, outside the district uh, to look at the amount of money that we are paying substitute teachers and we are substantially below some of our counterparts in neighboring districts. Um, when we actually calculated um, the rate that we are paying for teacher aides and for custodial cleaners, we are paying um, we are paying $79 for non-certified teaching subs, $88 for certified teaching subs and nurses. We're paying $95 for teaching aides and $121 for um, per diem subs um, cleaners. And so I think we, we should probably look at realigning that a little bit. And I'm not sure where you want to go with it, but that's something. there's also an analysis of neighboring districts and what they're paying subs, but we are having difficulty getting subs because our rate is lower than neighboring districts as well as other subs within our district. Do subs get a 1099 or a W-2? Yes, W-2. W-2? Okay. Well, we're not looking at decreasing or are we looking at decreasing the other, like teacher aides and cleaner rates, or are we just looking at increasing the... Well, we are looking at initially, probably not looking at decreasing, but um, that would be, because then we're going to have trouble getting subs in, in those areas, and some are, are negotiated. I mean, I don't know what the... Their contractual. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I would find, I find it hard to pay, not that cleaners aren't doing an amazing job, but I find it hard to pay a cleaner more than a certified teacher. Right. I mean, we'd have to, at the very least, bring the certified teachers up to the same rate as the cleaners are getting, I would think. And I think that that's why we're approaching this conversation, because we see the inequity within the, within the district and outside of the district. So approximately how, how many hours are we talking about in a, in a given school year for uh, substitute certified teachers? Uncertified Did. teachers can work no more than 40 days as a substitute teacher within a district. Um, a certified teacher can be appointed into a long-term subs position. They could be in for a full year. So let's use this year as an example. Yeah. Uh, what's the budget line for uh, substitute teachers at, at the rate of $88 an hour? And what would be the impact on our budget next year if we increased it to be uh, comparable to the cleaners rate, for example. And I think I'll defer that question to you. Well, I'll certainly work on that yeah. for you. <laughs> yeah, I don't have it right on Yeah, so he's probably looking sure. at I'm sub glad, but I'm not that good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's the total impact on the budget of making right. such a change? You know, you might say you go up $10. Well, that, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> but I think you're also, what you're going to find is as you start doing more staff development and you do good staff development, your need for subs is going to increase right. slightly. But the good news is that um, you can run those subs through BOCES and get BOCES aid back if it's through staff for staff development purposes. Okay. What percentage would you say is staff development subs, roughly? Well, we get 30, about 35 percent back. But of all our subs, are they, what would you say would be staff development? You could just shoot us something. Well, you have to the I have that information because I have to fill out a form to get yeah. that so I can get back to you on that. All right, great. I mean, it seems to make perfect sense that our rate is way too low. So it's just something we have to think about. Okay. Um. So due to your thoroughness, you're <laughs> <laughs> Costing us a couple of bucks, Dr. Bauer. I'm sorry. But I guess that's why you were hired. <laughs> that's all about it. So I uh, think this is for you. This 14. Is, yeah. Julia? Well, this is a discussion item uh, for the board member special election, um, which will take place at the next meeting. Okay. Uh, for those out there, BOCES uh, has a board of directors that governs BOCES. Um, the member districts, there are 18 of them, where one of them uh, elects the board. Uh, and I guess there was either a resignation or something, so there's an opening 
Um, so this is a special election. Uh, two candidates were appointed, uh, one from the Chappaqua District, one from the Peekskill District. And how do we actually vote? Do we roll call? Do we fill out a piece of paper? How do we do this? I've never done this before. Roll call. I think we just we'll come up with. Uh, do we? Next, there's an attachment there. There's going to be an official v ballot um, to choose. It says um, one vacancy. Um, so there's five. And there of will us. be two candidates. Uh, so. You're, you're going to vote on who you're going to, um, you're yeah. going to choose who you're going to vote for, and then the clerk um, will certify that and send it back to both seats. If you scroll down, the ballot's actually, that takes part of the it. next meeting. And so you have the names and the people you would decide who, who the board as a whole would be voting for. So at the next meeting, we just, you'll give us the thing, we'll fill it out and give it back to you? And there's five of us? It has to be by resolution that the board will decide which candidate they want to vote for. Okay. And then um, Julia will certify that and send it back to BOCES. Okay. <laughs> and we do that at the next meeting? Or yes. we do that right now? No, that's at no, the, next the next meeting. meeting. Okay, so we can't do it right now. We can discuss it right now, I guess, okay. if you want to do, but the official vote, I guess, happens next meeting. Okay. Is what they're saying. Got it. Would you guys like to discuss the two candidates right now? Well, should we be discussing the candidates in, in, in uh, oh, I mean, we're discussing personal, I mean, well, they don't board. go to this district, but, I mean, can we discuss, like, one candidate over another in public? Yeah. As far as, because we're, you know, sure. I don't know. Okay. I mean, we're giving... Yeah. I don't know we're not giving personal information, but we are, you were saying one person does this, one person does that. I mean, can we, can we do that? Is that a, or is that an executive session conversation? No, I think it's public. Okay. The public has this now anyway, so. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so we have to just decide which one of the two. I was angling towards the peak skill person just from a more grounded background. Right. Yeah, I mean. But that's Chappaqua just my is more opinion. finance guy, and uh, this guy is a, is a teacher in the Bronx. So, no, I'm just saying. So it's a one's coming from an educational side, and one's coming right. from a finance side. Right. right. Yep. So. And also, uh, November 10th, I think, is the BOCES board meeting, which I know I'm going to, and we wrote a letter on behalf of the um, administrative budget. Yes. Um, I think Chappaqua was one of the. Uh, advocates for changing the formula which would cost us more money annually um, <coughs> not that that has anything to do with it but I think it does something to do with it, I mean, for me that's kind of what makes me think about that's a big difference for me between the two candidates that the Peekskill candidate is more aligned with us in terms of our yes uh, administrative and I thought they were unreasonable with both these so okay all right so we'll vote at the next Election and we'll fill it out and you'll certify it and then you'll send it in. Okay. Yep. Um, 15, last one. Uh, liaison advocation, uh, advocacy member. I think, I think we spoke about this once before, but the question is Does anybody want to be the Westchester Putnam School Board Association liaison to the legislative advocacy group, which meets, I think, monthly? They meet in Westchester. Uh, the meetings start, I think, at 8 o'clock. Um, I did it a couple of years in the past. Uh, you know, it's, it's educational, it's good, uh, it's a huge time commitment. Um, I personally can't do it this time. If anybody else wants to do it, we do get all the information anyway. So, anybody wants to do it, feel free to speak up. <laughs> If not, <laughs> if not, the information will come, I'll monitor it, and we'll disperse it that way. How's that sound? Yeah. Okay. And just so you know, I will be joining you Monday night. Yep. yep. Great. Uh, can we rotate our attendance there? Like we, that we send a rep yeah, you can. to meetings, but we don't send necessarily the same person? Yeah, you can. Okay. 
Uh, any communication from the public? No. Uh, anything else from the board? No. Okay. Uh, we're going to make a motion to go into executive session for personnel. Yes. Uh, for employment history of a certain individual. Uh, no action will be taken when we won't come back into public session and do anything after that. So you guys can go home and watch the election results or whatever you do. And thank you for coming, all of you. Thanks for all your Have a good night. feedback, everybody. <laughs>